Okay, so let's go ahead and, and pick up where we left off. So we left off, we we're talking about cell structure. Um, and so the, we got to the cytoskeletal um, piece of it. And so we're kind of rounding out the last portion of our chapter here. And so we're going to take a look at the cytoskeleton and junctions. So basically, when you take a look at the cytoskeleton, this kind of um, represents a bit of an innovation for eukaryotic cells. So basically cells like us um, who have essentially uh, organelles and things like that in them. So basically, the cytoskeleton is, is what it says, right? So cyto uh, stands for cell. This is the cell, skeleton of the cell. And so it's a series of protein fibers and things like that. Its job is for to maintain shape um, and also to allow anchorage for your organelles as they're moving around in the cell itself. Generally speaking, you have three major types of fibers that we see. We have microtubules, intermediate filaments, and actin filaments. And so let's take a look at the big ones first. So the microtubules themselves are probably the most heavily researched of all of them. And so when you take a look at the microtubules, um, and I just need to double check here just to make sure I turned actually my mic on because that would be like me to go through an entire class with not, the, with not having the mic on. Okay, so these guys are basically focused on locomotion. So basically how you move stuff around either in the cell or for the cell itself to move around. And generally speaking, when you take a look at microtubules, they uh, basically are assembled from a structure in animals called the centrosome. So this is like a microtubule organizing center. That's basically what this is. And so it kind of basically makes throughout the cell kind of similar to what train tracks are for light rail around the city, right? Basically it sort of, or roads around the city. It's essentially the pathway um, that kind of creates a direction from point A to point B. So basically it kind of creates a road. So as things are moving around, you have to have a place to move. You have to have something to move on. You have to have a direction and navigation. So that's basically what these guys provide is essentially anywhere you want to go in the cell, there's a microtubule in the cell that will basically get you there. And that's basically what you have. You also see not just in locomotion, but you also see microtubules as being heavy players in cell division as you're moving things, your DNA in this particular case, around in the cell. Uh, and they move basically around a structure called the spindle apparatus, which basically moves the chromosomes around it. So they're heavily, heavily important in just locomotion in general. Um, and just kind of moving stuff around. The other filament is going to be the actin filament. And so this is made of a protein called actin. It's like a very long, thin chain of basically actin monomers that will essentially form this kind of threaded rope that kind of creates this sort of long, fibrous chain. Generally speaking, they're, in they're involved in movement. For instance, they are... Uh, incredibly important in muscle contraction. It's one of the main fibers in your muscles to allow you to actually contract your muscles. And then of course we have intermediate filaments, which are a little bit dodgier. So these are basically composed of several different types of proteins. Not that an, an intermediate filament is made of several different types of proteins. It's there's several different types of intermediate filaments, each of which is composed of a different protein. Like here's an example. Um, for instance, keratin, right, which is the protein associated with hair, nails, and things like that, is uh, basically a protein that will form an intermediate filament type of a fiber um, that basically allows your cells to have shape. There's also another type of intermediate filament that you see in the nucleus just underneath that nuclear envelope kind of creating the spherical shape of the nucleus. Uh, that's, that's a type of intermediate filament. It's called the, um, the nuclear lamina. But what this basically is, is essentially an intermediate filament that's made out of a protein called laminin. 
right? So there's a different protein there, different type of an intermediate filament. That's what we mean by this is kind of different. So basically the functions do vary, but mostly it acts as a scaffold for the cell. So if you think about it, a scaffold is sort of like a kind of a lattice-like structure that basically kind of creates shape and infrastructure, right? It's kind of like the skeleton of a building, um, that kind of scaffold, like, so this is like the scaffold of the cell. And so typically the intermediate filaments tend to sort of hang out there and sort of create the overall shape um, of the cell um, itself, while things like microtubules and, and um, actin filaments tend to sort of work on some of the motion stuff and the movement stuff. So this is sort of like your framework, your intermediate filaments are sort of like your framework of various types and in various situations. Now, one of the consequences of some of the things that we can build biologically using these uh, filaments, microtubules in particular, are really important. Cilia and flagella are basically little extensions, fibrous extensions that are important. Cilia and flagella are both made out of microtubules and they're both basically made the same way. The difference is in cilia, they basically are like little short hair-like structures. And typically what'll happen is they'll kind of beat way back and forth like that. And generally speaking, what they're doing is they'll basically create a local current that typically tends to move mucus. That's usually what they're doing or fluid. Okay. So they're kind of sweeping stuff around the flagellum, same basic idea, only it's just a really long, long fiber. And the flagellum basically is purely for locomotion. So for instance, in us, a good example of where we see cilia is in our respiratory tract. So in the respiratory liner in our trachea, we have a group of cells that basically have cilia on them and they produce mucus. So they're called um, pseudostratified ciliated columnar cells. So they kind of look like this. They're like large columnar cells and they have little cilia on their surface like this. And what happens is they secrete mucus on the outside. So you kind of have this thick, layer of mucus on the inside of your trachea. And what happens is when you breathe in dust particles, it gets trapped in that sticky mucus. And then the cilia basically sweep that up through your, dige through your digestive tract, through your respiratory tract into your cough zone so you can cough it out. And this is one of the reasons why when you're breathing in a lot of particulate matter, you kind of get that little crackly kind of bloody cough is because your respiratory system is constantly trying to sweep that out of your system. Matter of fact, that's also one of the reasons why smokers have that lovely little smokers pack, right? That's constantly coughing and, and things of that nature. That's or spitting, right? Smokers spit a lot. That's because they're they're inhaling smoke particles, which are getting trapped in that mucus, and the cilia are trying to sweep that out because it's thinking, wow, you're in a really smoky area. We're gonna go ahead and save you. They don't realize you're doing that intentionally. Right. So they're trying to get that out. Um, the flagella, basically the only flagellated cell we have in human beings is a sperm, right? And that's basically important, especially if you want to be fertile as a male, right? So a lot of male fertility sometimes is associated with breakdowns in the uh, sperm, uh, the sperm flagella formation. So if you can't form the flagella correctly, then you're not going to be able to swim to the point of reproduction where the egg is waiting. So these are actually micrographs, really good micrographs, actually. Um, basically, uh, you can see you have your sperm here, which basically has the headpiece, and then of course the long tail, which is the flagellum, which basically whips back and forth and essentially just kind of moves like just kind of waving in the fluid. And then the cilia, you can see here, this is a another good example of cilia. You can see very short hairs and they're basically oscillating back and forth and kind of creating that little local current. They both have the same kind of construction though. So if you cut them and cross section, take a look at them, they have this same kind of construction, which in biology we call the nine plus two structure. That is to say that you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine doublets. These are microtubule doublets and microtubule basically is a long cylinder like structure. So you have two of those guys stuck together around a shaft of two microtubules. So it's almost like a bike wheel. You can see they're interconnected to each other and that's part of how the flagella moves and how it basically bends in order to be able to create um, force to be able to move 
in this case, the sperm or the cilia um, so that it can actually wave back and forth, okay? So that's the common structure. You can see microtubules are at the heart um, of that one. We'll talk more about actin filaments when we get to the muscle chapter, um, but we'll save that discussion for later. Now, another important piece of cells and uh, cell biology is the extracellular matrix. It's also very important, especially for um, health because the extracellular matrix is basically the outside environment of a cell. So every cell will basically secrete molecules to the outside of itself, creating kind of like a little local environment, basically this kind of gamish of stuff out there that is the extracellular matrix or abbreviated ECM. Now what's out there? Typically the cell will put out there different types of proteins, different types of polysaccharides and things like that. Um, and so it kind of differs from cell to cell, depending on what you want to put out there. However, the common proteins that you see out there typically are collagen. Um, and so collagen is basically tough and structural. So this resists stretching. If you want to know what pure collagen looks like, just grab the back of your Achilles tendon. That's almost pure collagen. So it can actually be quite tough but it's still a type of connective tissue, so it's still a little on the, on the flexible side. And then you have another type of a protein that you put out there, elastin. And so this basically is uh, what provides you with flexibility and elasticity. So depending on who you are and depending on what you need, you may need a flexible extracellular matrix. You may need a little bit of elasticity out there. You can put elastin out there to make you a little more elastic, or you may have to be tough and very durable, in which case you might load yourself up with some collagen. A couple of other things that you'll see out there is a molecule called fibronectin. So fibronectin basically is a type of adhesion protein that's, we'll talk about connections here in, in a couple of slides, that binds to a protein called integrin, and we'll see that here in just a second. Um, and this basically will anchor the cell. These two guys together essentially will anchor the cell to its extracellular matrix by connecting to the cytoskeleton of the cell. It also plays a role in cell signaling, which is a slightly different topic. So here's kind of what it looks like. So here's your membrane. This is your extracellular matrix down here. So you can see that you have all these little kind of polysaccharide um, types of molecules. In this case, it's what's called a a proteoglycan, which is kind of like a protein carbohydrate, sort of a hybrid molecule. Um, and so tend, these uh, tend to have a, a little bit of lubrication to them. They tend to be a little on the slippery side uh, to kind of give yourself a little bit of fluidity. Um, you can see a large collagen cable here. Um, typically the elastin is thinner. So here's your elastin fiber. Now the integrin, is gonna be this guy here. So it's integrin because it's integral. It's inserted into the membrane. On the inside cellular piece of it um, is going to be uh, just below the plasma membrane. It's gonna be a region of actin. We refer to this as cortical cortex, means the outside layer. This is gonna be your cortical actin layer. It kind of forms like a little bit of a foundational substrate just underneath the plasma membrane to give it a little bit of structure. So it's actually fully part of that sort of support structure of your cytoskeleton. So the integrin will attach to the actin cytoskeleton on the inside of the cell. And as it basically goes through the membrane, what will happen is it'll attach to this little green guy right here, which is fibronectin. And this guy will then attach to collagen. And so here basically what's happening is you've got your cell that's anchored now to your extracellular matrix and those tough collagenous fibers in your extracellular matrix. But you've anchored it to your skeleton. Basically in terms of um, how this works, it's very similar to what happens when basically I kind of steady myself by grabbing onto like the wall or like the lectern, right? So basically what happens is I've got my own skeleton inside of me, right? And then what I do is I use something to grab onto my external environment, something that I've created, just like the extracellular matrix, like the lectern, right? So we basically created this. Somebody had to build this. And so what I do is I use this as my environment to steady myself. What I'm doing is I'm attaching myself to the lectern so that I have stability. 
Okay. And that's what cells are doing. So they basically create this environment for themselves that's both structural and also functional. So it's got more than just structural support. There's a lot of other things that they use the sex share the matrix for as well. But it allows them to be able to have context and anchorage for that particular purpose. So one of the reasons why this is an important discussion to have is because when we start talking about tissues, the one thing we notice is that certain tissues are basically defined by their external matrix. Connective tissue is a good example. Bone is a good example. Cartilage is a good example. And then there's going to be different types of tissues like epithelial tissue and neural tissue that's defined by its cells. And that's basically where we get to the idea of junctions, because in order to create a tissue, you have to join cells together. And how do you join them together? With adhesion or connections, right? Junctions between those cells. You rivet them together. There's three main types of connections that we're gonna see. First of all, there's what's called adhesion junctions, which are basically very tight um, connections that attach parts of your cytoskeleton to your adjacent cells. So we'll take a look at that. We have tight junctions, which basically produce a bar barrier. So these are the tightest connection that we have. And we have gap junctions, which typically are just like channels that fuse two cells together. So these typically are open and maximize communication. So there's two different things here that you have to sort of balance when you're talking about connecting your cells together. You can either go for max communication or you can go for max barrier, but you can't have both. Right. So the more communicative you get, the more you have to let go of the barrier. OK, and so that's kind of a trade off. So here's what they look like. So here's your adhesion. You can see on the inside of cell number one, you've got this little protein pad at the plasma membrane periphery and it's connected to the actin. So this region right here is that cortical actin. So kind of building on the same idea that we just saw with integrin and fibronectin. So it's kind of building off that idea. But now instead, what happens is you've got these little attachment points, these receptors, if you will, that act like couplers, like train couplers, where basically they reach across that extracellular space and they kind of couple to each other, basically connecting each other together, like two train cars connecting each other together. And on the other cell, you can see they've got their protein connected to their cortical actin as well. And so the two of these then will be connected to each other, which are then connected to their cytoskeleton. That's an adhesion junction. Now notice, however, in the adhesion junction, you still have a little bit of space in between the cells. And that space can be used for communication. So you can still put stuff out there and you can communicate back and forth with uh, different cells. So they can kind of talk to each other and coordinate their activities. Yeah. So when two cells communicate, they'll secrete molecules outside of themselves so that they, they like, it's like passing notes in class, right? So when you're trying to communicate with each other, you kind of produce some sort of a message, you pass it on to your classmate and then they receive the communication and then they are able to act on those directions, okay? But the problem is you need room to do that, right? So if you're putting molecules out there, you have to have a little bit of space there so that you can put those molecules there and they can be received by your target cell. That makes sense? So the next one is tight junctions. You can see these guys are really riveted together. Literally, you just basically have two proteins that are just fastened together. There's no space here in between these guys. So there's not gonna be any communication. If you're going this way, you're maximizing barrier, minimizing communication. You're giving up on communication, right? But it's helpful if you're trying to create an impermeable barrier. They're actually quite effective. And then of course you have the other side, the gap junctions. The gap junctions literally are little channels, right? So basically here you have the cytoplasm of cell number one and the cytoplasm of cell number two. In this case, whatever happens, any kind of a change in your cytoplasm is going to immediately go right through those channels to cytoplasm number two. So these two cells literally are going to be hearing the same thing at the same time. 
So if you have instructions going to cell number one, it's gonna go through those gap junctions and cell number two is gonna hear it, right? And that's important. This is really helpful if you need to coordinate cellular activities and have a unified response, right? So that's a good example we see there is in um, heart muscle. That's the way your heart contracts. It's connected, interconnected with each other by gap junctions. So that when one heart cell hears the contract signal, they all hear it at the same time. So the heart gets to contract all in unison. And that's exactly what you need for your heart itself. Okay, now let's take a look at a little bit of metabolism. So this is gonna be kind of our me metabolic section. And then uh, this will wrap up this chapter. So basically when we take a look at metabolism, Metabolism essentially is all the chemical reactions, the lump sum of all the chemical reactions in your body. And you have different types of metabolic pathways which are broken up individually to do specific types of things. So for instance, you'll have a particular type of reactant that will then lead to a particular type of product, which is something that you need. Oftentimes in our body, our metabolic pathways are multi-stepped. So that's typically the case. So there's multiple steps involved in our metabolism, but generally speaking, they're all driven by enzymes and an enzyme, the way it works, basically will bind to its substrate and then it will basically pass that on. It'll do some sort of work and it'll pass that on. So here's what, I'm, here's what we have. I'm gonna take a look at this. We're gonna see this kind of as an example. <coughs> so here's what it looks like. So in this case, A is the substrate for enzyme E. So enzyme E1 is, is the enzyme. So what that means is E binds to A, does some sort of a chemical reaction on it and turns it into B, which is the product of that reaction. But it turns out that B is the substrate for E2, which then turns B into C. So that's its product. But then C turns out to be the substrate. That is to say what the enzyme works on for E3, which then turns it into your final product, which is D. Typically speaking, these guys in here are what's referred to as intermediates. You generally don't see B and C because the idea is that's not where you're stopping, right? It's a multi-step process, but what you see is A going to D, just does that by multiple steps, okay? And that's pretty typical. It's what we see a lot in our body, especially when we get into metabolism. Now, generally speaking, in order to control this process, which you always want to do, right? So in physiology, you always want to basically regulate what you're doing. Then you have what's called a bit of feedback uh, regulatory systems. Like for instance, uh, feedback inhibition is a good example. And what this means is when the end product, D for instance, feeds back at certain levels, and what it'll do is it'll shut down its own productivity. So that means then when you have enough D, you can have a almost like a safety valve where it automatically turns itself off. So you don't have to, it's kind of like a thermostat, right? So once you get to your temperature, then it automatically turns itself off. That's kind of like a negative feedback, okay? So already there. And so this basically will then um, turn that pathway off. You also have other types of feedback. You also have positive feedback as well. But that's the way you regulate that. And of course, with uh, the negative feedback, there's a lot of different and proteins involved and in how to regulate this pathway. So it gets very, very complicated very quickly. There's a lot going on and there's a lot of middle managers and sub managers and so forth. So um, that typically is, is well beyond the scope of this class, but um, just suffice it to say that it, it gets deeper, right? That pool gets much deeper and much broader and much more fascinating um, as you kind of get into it. Okay, but we did mention enzymes. So let's exactly uh, explain what these guys are, right? Because these guys are the big ones. These are biological catalysts. And what they do is they drive the chemical reactions of the body. So where you have a chemical reaction in your body, you have an enzyme that's driving that. Okay, now what does a catalyst do? The catalyst has basically two different types of definitions to it. First of all, um, a catalyst has to speed up the rate of a reaction. If it doesn't speed up the rate of a reaction, then it's not a catalyst. 
Um, the other piece of it that I'm going to jump down here is they're also not used up or altered at all by the reaction. They're not a member of the reaction because if they get changed by the reaction, they're not a catalyst. They are a reactant, right? They're a member of the, of the, the reaction. So enzymes basically are able to be reused over and over and over again. Oftentimes when we see enzymes, they're oftentimes named after what they work on. So a good example of this, for instance, is lipase. And typically you can see whether a molecule is an enzyme or not by the suffix A-S-E oftentimes betrays that you're working with an enzyme. But that's an enzyme whose job it is to work on lip, lip, lipids, so fats, right? That basically works on fats. Um, another one, sucrase, is an enzyme that works on the carbohydrate sucrose, right? So it breaks up sucrose. So oftentimes enzymes are named after what they do and who they work on. Now, generally speaking, all enzymes have what's called an active site, and this is critical because this is basically where they're going to bind to their substrate. It essentially is a three-dimensional pocket designed to only bind its substrate. So for instance, if I have an enzyme with an active site that looks like that, it's only going to bind to it's substrate, it's like a lock and key sort of a thing. That's a good way to think of it for now. But this basically means that the enzymes are specific for the substrate. So for instance, sucrase doesn't wanna have anything to do with glucose or maltose, different types of carbohydrates. It only has eyes for sucrose, right? That's because of the lock and key nature of the active site to its substrate. It's very similar to that. Matter of fact, that used to be the predominant model that we used to use. So this is kind of what it looks like. So typically speaking, you'll see enzymes working on degradation. So this is basically in this case where you take your substrate and you can see that the active site is three-dimensionally formed to fit the substrate. And when it binds to it, it creates what's called the enzyme substrate complex or the ES complex. And then it does its chemistry on that. In this case, it cleaves it in half. And once it cleans it in half, it's no longer whatever the substrate is, it's something different now, right? And so it basically releases those products and you get your enzyme back, which means you can come right on back and grab another substrate and get back to work, right? So you don't just do one and done, you constantly, you, you, you work on one, you break it apart, you let it go, you grab another one, you break it apart, you let it go, you grab another one, you break it apart, you let it go. Why? Because your enzyme is never consumed or altered by the reaction. It just keeps on going. Now you can also do this in a synthesis sort of way. So for instance, here's a synthesis enzyme, which will take these two substrates. In this case, they're the two individual molecules. They'll land right in there to form your EES complex. And then it, in this case, it'll basically stitch them together and it'll release that combination molecule. So this is kind of a situation where you have um, a molecule, which is AB breaking down into a and B. And in this case, it's the opposite. Here you have A plus B coming and forming AB, your fusion molecule, right? And so oftentimes these will, you can easily write this um, in one, one line by doing this, simple as that. You have a reverse reaction. So this reaction right here is that one. This reaction right here is this one. So it's a forward and a reverse reaction, which is very biological. We always work with forward and reverse reactions. So the question is how, and this is always a question we have, um, so, so, okay, great. I'm okay with that now. I'm, I'm okay with the fact that an enzyme speeds up the reaction. I'm okay with the fact that it's not consumed, so it does conform to a chemistry definition of what a catalyst does and what it's supposed to do. But here's my question. I may understand what a catalyst does in chemistry, like palladium metal, for instance, right? When it brings two reactants together, but what does an enzyme do, right? What is, ex what is it exactly doing that catalyzes or speeds up this reaction? And what it actually does uh, specifically is it does something called lowering the what's called the activation energy 
or the energy of activation. So this is the amount of energy needed to start a chemical reaction. It basically presents as an energy barrier to the forward progress of the reaction. You have to get over that hurdle if you're gonna go forward. Um, and so typically what enzymes will do is they will lower this hurdle, this barrier, making it a little easier for that reaction to go forward, okay? Now, oftentimes enzymes can either act in uh, concert with others or they can act in solo. They can act with non-protein molecules, like uh, we refer to those as coenzymes, which typically are vitamins. Um, minerals typically um, are what we refer to as cofactors. So both of these vitamins and minerals can act in concert with enzymes to be able to facilitate um, a chemical reaction or a metabolic reaction in your body, okay, which is one of the reasons why you want to make sure you eat a nutritious diet with lots of vitamins. And also you want to make sure you get your minerals in there as well, right? Minerals, by the way, if you're wondering what the definition of these are. So vitamin basically are molecules that contain carbon. Minerals generally are metal ions. So things like iron, magnesium, calcium, things like that, those are all minerals. Um, when you take a look at the B complex, it's like a big complex carbon structure with lots of carbons. It's like a big cage. It's like a, a very complex structure, but they're all carbon-based, the vitamins are. So here's what it looks like. So basically, when you plot your molecules in terms of how much energy they have in them against the progress of the reaction, you'll notice that in the reactants themselves, basically they have a certain amount of energy in them. And so the idea is they want to move forward to products which are lower in energy. So you would think that this would be a spontaneous reaction because after all, things that are in high energy state want to naturally go toward or gravitate toward things that are in a low energy state. So you would think that this would be energetic favorable, that the universe would want this to go forward like lightning fast, right? But it doesn't. Why? Because you got an energy hurdle here. That's the activation energy, which is the blue curve. So really what you have to do with your reactants in order to get this to go forward is you have to increase their energy to the point where they can get over this hurdle. And then once they do that, down they go. Here's the problem. It's kind of like you getting on a slide, right? Before you basically get on your slide, what do you have to do? You have to climb the ladder, right? And so, if that ladder is a little tough to get to, then we have to lower the ladder for you, right? So that's kind of what this is doing. Basically what an energy activation curve looks like under an enzyme, basically it's lower. So you basically lower this hurdle that allows the reactants to be able to scooch over that little hill. So if you're into track and field, it's like high hurdles, right? If you can't get over that hurdle because it's just a little too high, we can lower that hurdle down so that you can get over it, right? That's like a cat, that's what an enzyme does. Let me lower this for you so you can get over that obstacle and you can get to the finish line, okay? Now, what's the benefit of this? Easy. The one thing that your cells want absolutely without question is control. They're absolute control freaks. So the idea of a chemical reaction that just goes without you having anything to say about it is a nightmare for the cell. That's absolutely what they don't want. They want to call the shots. They want to say, I dictate when and where and how this reaction goes forward. If the reaction is automatically turned off because it can't get over that hurdle, then it automatically sets the cell in control. Because guess who gets to make the enzymes? The cell, which means you have everything you want. Absolute control over when this reaction gets turned on. When you want it turned on, guess what you do? You make your enzyme. It lowers the activation energy and the reaction goes forward. When you want this reaction turned off, all you have to do, stop making the enzyme, the reaction's already off. That make sense? So that gives you masterful control over everything. Okay, so a lot of your metabolic reactions are happening in the mitochondria. As a matter of fact, a lot of the cellular respiration, and cellular respiration is simply this. It's basically the production of your energy currency, ATP, right? So this is basically like your 
rechargeable cell phone battery. How many of you guys are app junkies? You love to download the latest and newest apps. Be honest, I'm right there. I'm terrible. I'm like, oh man, I don't have any room. So now I gotta delete all this important stuff so I can put my apps on there, right? How many of you guys are basically phone zombies? You'll walk around like this. All of us, right? I see you guys out there walking around, <laughs> running into each other. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> it's like, so your apps are like the biological tasks that you need to do, right? So everything that you need to do in order to answer your big biological questions of life, in order to be able to reproduce, those are all like your apps, your cellular apps. But guess what? In order to play your favorite game or to access your favorite app, what do you need? You need space, that's, certain, that's true. You need energy, right? So what happens when your percentage starts to go down? You gotta plug that cell phone in, don't you? Why? Because as a battery that we never pay attention to, we half the time never ever see it but we know it's in there somewhere right so we basically recharge it so that we can use our apps if there's an app that we need to use in order to achieve some sort of a task we have to make sure we have a full cell phone right so that's basically exactly what's happening here so you have biological tasks that need to be done your cell phone battery is essentially ATP. It's your rechargeable battery. You can use it, generate energy to run your app. And then what you have to do is you have to go back and recharge it so that you can use it again. Yeah. The, I think the ATP is the battery. So the mitochondria is basically, um, I mean, I guess it's like the power plant. It's the one that's actually making the the, pro, the the product. It's part of the charging system. So you can think of the mitochondria as like a combination of your wall outlet plus the electricity that's coming through your wall plus the charger itself. Um, and so that's kind of what all the mitochondria is. Everything you need in order to fill up your battery. That's kind of what the mitochondria does. So basically in the process of cell respiration, you're making ATP which essentially basically means you're gonna be taking glucose, which is made by plants in photosynthesis, and you're gonna be converting that chemical energy into ATP, and that's cellular respiration. Generally speaking, in order to do that process, we need oxygen. That's why you have to breathe oxygen. Um, and we give off our waste product, which is CO2. That's the reason why we breathe out CO2. Generally speaking, our mitochondria has an inner and an outer membrane. The outer membrane is pretty simple, but the inner membrane is folded up into uh, little folds called cristae, which is intended to increase surface area, which means you're increasing your productive surface that you can generate and make ATP from. And so generally speaking, we have um, a mitochondria. We think that was a prokaryotic um, invention initially because respiration is a, a, a used by everybody. But this is what your mitochondria looks like. So you can see this is an electron micrograph of an electron mitochondria. It's very classic, very, very basic. It's very uh, distinct, right? There's nothing that quite looks like a kidney bean with tiger stripes on it. And when you kind of break it down, you're going to see you have your outer membrane here. And then you have a uh, space, right? So this is your inner membrane space. And then you have your inner membrane, which is folded up into this crystal. And in the inner membrane is embedded all these enzymes that are necessary for the production of ATP. That's the reason why you had that folded up. The middle portion or the middle fluid is what's referred to as the matrix of the mitochondria itself. And so this is basically your energy power plant. This is the one that's making all of your energy and essentially making ATP for you. 
So let's take a look then at the ATP cycle. So essentially when we need energy, um, we hydrolyze ATP, and that's gonna give us a phosphate plus ADP, and it's gonna give us a burst of energy. And so that burst of energy will then be used to do some sort of biological work, just like the burst of energy from your cell phone battery is utilized by your app to do whatever activity your app is designed to do, right? But then once you use that packet of energy for your app, that is gone and you have to replace that energy in your cell phone, which is the reason why you plug it in. Same basic idea. So when we eat food, which is heavy laden with energy, like glucose, for instance, then it is basically going to be taken from that food molecule and we're gonna use that energy to basically recharge our ATP. And then it goes over and over and over and over again. So that's kind of what the cycle looks like. So ATP basically is broken down into ADP and phosphate, but you're gonna get an energy burst from that. That's gonna allow you to be able to do your biological work, whatever your metabolic work is. And then what happens is when you eat food, you're going to be consuming energy from glucose and you're gonna take the energy out of that molecule and you're gonna basically use it to reconstruct or to recharge your ATP, to recreate your ATP, okay? So this is like the recharging process. And that's basically what's happening. So you get your energy from the food that you eat. And also you get materials from that. Right, so you basically have this kind of energetic cycle in your body. And as long as you have food to eat, you're going to have a constant source of energy. And that's of course the reason why when we start getting um, food shortages, it becomes a problem because you don't have enough energy coming in to fuel all the many energetic demands that your body is doing. Okay. Just like if you don't have enough percentage on your cell phone, it's not gonna be enough energy in there to accomplish all the activities of all the apps that you've got running, okay, which seems to be my problem. I drain my phone down rather quickly because I've got all sorts of stuff going on. Probably too much stuff for my own good. Okay, so cellular respiration. Let's take a quick look at this and we'll kind of wrap this up, uh, this chapter up and we'll kind of move into the uh, next chapter. So cellular respiration basically has a couple of major steps, some major pathways, which we talked about before. So we have multi-step pathways. Um, that will essentially take a glucose molecule, and where this came, this comes from photosynthesis. So typically, what's going to happen is you're going to have free energy coming from the sun, and that's going to be turned and converted into glucose for photosynthesis. So our plants are doing that for us. And then we're going to eat the glucose, and we're going to take the energy out of that glucose, and we're going to wring that out and use that to sort of uh, regenerate our ATP. So we have a couple of major types of pathways. The first one is glycolysis. Uh, that leads next to what's called the citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, which then terminates, in our case, in what's called the electron transport chain. These are major pathways, and they'll allow lots and lots of energy to be created. So let's take a look at each one in step. Now, I'm not going to go through the gory detail necessarily of all of this, just kind of give you broad brush strokes of this so you can get the general idea. Glycolysis basically will take a six carbon glucose molecule and it'll break it into two three carbon molecules called pyruvate. Now, generally speaking, if you don't have any place for this pyruvate to go, this can be a waste product. So you gotta do something with this. You have to utilize it to get more energy out of it, or you gotta get rid of it. Somehow you gotta do something with it. You can't just let it lay around, okay? So generally speaking, glycolysis is happening in the cytoplasm of the cell, and it's pretty much in every cell type, whether or not you're consuming oxygen, or not. So it's, for instance, anaerobic, um, anaerobic organisms. Yeah, there, go. there. And no. This. No, it's anaerobic organisms that don't use oxygen still do glycolysis. Everybody does this. In addition to pyruvate, it creates a couple of other molecules, ATP, which is what we want, right? That's it, that's our energy currency, so that's a good thing, right? But it also creates what's called NADH. Now, what exactly is NADH? It's a type of nucleic acid, 
But basically, this is an electron taxi. It toggles between two states, just like a taxi. You've got an empty state. That, which we refer to as NAD+. Plus. And then if you add electrons to it, it will be in its full state, which we refer to as NADH, okay? Just like a taxi picking up passengers. But a taxi is not designed to hang on to passengers, is it? Their job is to get rid of you and go pick up somebody else. So the job of this is not to hang on to electrons, it's to go deliver it somewhere and go pick up more. So when it delivers it, it's basically gonna ditch those electrons and it's gonna convert back to NAD plus like the empty taxi, who can then circle back around and go back to the airport and pick up more passengers. So it's a, literally an electron taxi. So what that means is what you've done in glycolysis is you've created a potential waste product in pyruvate. You created some ATP, that's good, yay. But now you've also filled up your taxi. And guess what you gotta do? You gotta figure out a way to empty out that taxi because it's not designed to just hang on to those electrons, right? So there's some work to do. So even those organisms that aren't using oxygen still have to do some business here, right? So that's happening out here in the cytoplasm. So here you can see you have a glucose molecule that comes from your bloodstream. It's gonna move into your body through a glucose transporter. Oxygen's gonna come in along with it. And then you're gonna have glycolysis happening out here in the cytoplasm where you're gonna convert that into pyruvate. Then what's gonna happen is pyruvate is gonna be transported into the mitochondria where it's gonna be prepared if you're breathing oxygen. And in the preparation reaction, you're gonna take your pyruvates and it prepares them for the next step, which is gonna be citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle. Now, generally speaking, this is only in the presence of oxygen. What happens if you're not breathing oxygen? Well, there's a default. If you're not breathing oxygen, your default is to move into what's called an anaerobic form of metabolism or specifically fermentation. So in fermentation, basically this is your backup plan to deal with what you just generated from glycolysis so that you can keep doing glycolysis. You, know, you got to get rid of pyruvates and you've got to deal with those NADHs. Okay, that's what fermentation is doing. So that prep is happening in the mitochondria and in the matrix itself. <clears throat> but here you basically have your NADHs. So you have your electrons from glycolysis coming in. You have some more NADHs that are gonna be made from the preparation step of pyruvate. And they're gonna to have to take these passengers somewhere. So we'll talk about that here in just a second. But before we do that, the pyruvate is prepared for the Krebs cycle, which actually converts into acetyl-CoA. So pyruvate in the preparation actually turns into a molecule called acetyl-CoA, which is literally a two carbon molecule with what's called a coenzyme A. It's another, it's like a shuttle molecule. That grabs onto this two carbon molecule. And that is the beginning molecule for the Krebs cycle. So what feeds into the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle is acetyl-CoA. So this is the starting molecule for the next step. Now the Krebs cycle, basically this is happening in the matrix of the mitochondria. So that inner fluid portion of it this is gonna complete that breakdown of glucose. It's gonna be breaking some more bonds between carbons. And so what it does, it takes this acetyl-CoA and it produces more ATP, yay. Got a little bit more, right? So it helps to breathe oxygen. It's also gonna produce more NADH and it's gonna release carbon dioxide, which is your waste product. Now this is basically happening um, here in this little cycle right here. So it just kind of keeps running around and around and around in a cycle. It's producing both NADH, which is one type of a taxi, and FADH2, which is another type of taxi. Think of it this way. If NADH is yellow cab, FADH2 is metro cab, right? So metro taxi. So two different taxi companies, they're doing the same thing. They're grabbing electrons and they're bringing them somewhere. 
Okay, so now right now what's happened is so far you've created four different ATP, but you've got all these taxis hanging around that are full of electrons. They got to go somewhere, right? You got to do something with those guys. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the next step is. So once we create our FADH2, which we just mentioned, then we're going to be sending these electrons to the electron transport chain. So this is basically the drop-off point. for NADH and FADH2. This is where the taxis are going. This is where they're dropping off their passengers. And so all those electrons that you picked up from glycolysis and from the citric acid cycle and from the pyru -pre preparation, they're gonna to go to the system. And in this electron transport chain are carrier proteins that are in the membrane of the cristae. And so what they do is they take electrons from the NADH and they pass them on to the next carrier in like a relay. And so you can actually see these down here, your, ex, your electron transport chain is gonna be down here. And it's basically going to be passing these on from one to the next to the next. And this is basically what's happening. So if you take a look at your membrane, okay, I'm gonna do it here. So if you take a look at your membrane, you have these transport proteins. So NADH will come in, deliver the electrons, and leave as NAD plus where it can go to like glycolysis or wherever to pick up more. But when it does that, the electrons are like energy. So this little complex uh, this protein in the membrane, this carrier protein, will basically take a proton and pump it into the intermembrane space. And then what it'll do is it'll pass those electrons on to the next guy in line. We'll take another proton, pump it into the intermembrane space. He'll pass the electrons on to the next guy in line. We'll take a proton or hydrogen ion, either one, they're the same, and it'll pump it into the intermembrane space. Now, here's the problem. You can't just de indefinitely pass on the electrons. Somebody's got to hang on to it, right? Somebody's got to be the terminal possessor of that electron. Who is it? It's oxygen. So oxygen plus hydrogen plus the electrons will basically form water, which is the reason why you breathe out water vapor is because that's your metabolic waste product. And oxygen is also the terminal electron acceptor. It's the one that says, I'll keep these for good. We'll keep passing them on. I'll keep these for good. They'll be mine. And I'll turn myself into water. And then you'll breathe me out. I'll become part of the atmosphere. Okay. That's the reason you breathe oxygen is because you have to have somebody to take those electrons away from you. Otherwise, what's going to happen is it's going to get log jammed, like a bad traffic accident on I-25. And it's just going to plug everything up and everything's going to come to a screeching halt. Okay, this is the reason why we die if we're lacking oxygen. Now, the next step, which is basically um, a way to make ATP, utilizes this is the protein. So, what you've created now is a gradient. So, on the outside, you have a high concentration of your proton, hydrogen ion. Right. On the inside, it's a low concentration of hydrogen ion or your proton. This thing wants to go from high to low, right? As it does so, it releases energy the same way that you do when you slide down a slide, right? At the top of the slide, you're full of what's called potential energy. It's a form of stored energy. It's not active, but it's there. And then as you slide down, you release that energy in the form of kinetic energy, the energy of motion. And that energy is what's being shed. So if you were to capture that kinetic energy, you would be able to do something with it. And that's what's happening here. So what's happening here is you take the energy of this proton going down its gradient. And as it sheds that energy, it transfers that to the production of ATP. Not unlike a hydroelectric dam. Right, because you have the energy in the water column behind the dam, like Hoover Dam has Lake Mead behind it. 
lot of energy in that water column, right? How do you know that? Stand in front of Hoover Dam when it breaks. You'll feel all the energy of Lake Mead coming straight into your grill, right? So in this case, what Hoover Dam does is it says, listen, I understand that you want to go from high to low. You want to flow down hill. But we're going to make sure you do that under our circumstances. So what they do is they allow the water to move down through the, the dam, through the turbines, and it basically uses that magnet coil strategy of water to basically spin the turbines and you're spinning the coil around the magnet. That creates electricity. So the energy of the water spinning the turbines creates the electricity. So the energy is being converted to electricity, which then lights Las Vegas. Same thing's happening here. You use the natural energy that's being shed by these protons as they flow downhill, and you're diverting that energy into basically packing it into ATP. That makes sense? So it's basically a hydroelectric dam. And then of course, from what you get there is a lot of ATP. So instead of just a few ATP, three, you know, two or four ATP, when you employ the electron transport chain, you're going to be making something on the order of 36 to 38 ATP per glucose molecule. So it's good to breathe oxygen, right? So if you're an aerobic organism, you're breathing oxygen, you have the ability to become big. Why? Because you're going to be making enough energy to support a lot of energetic demand, which our big body demands a lot of energy. If your strategy is only to do glycolysis because you're not breathing oxygen, by the way, if you're not breathing oxygen, where are we here? No. If you're not breathing oxygen, this is where you stop. You only go forward if you're aerobic and breathing oxygen. But notice how many ATP do you get from just glycolysis alone? Two as opposed to a ton, right? So when you're anaerobic, you are not efficient at all. That means you don't have a lot of energy to support a lot of your body demands, which means that by default, by simply picking to be anaerobic, you are going to have a very small body. This is the reason why anaerobic organisms are like bacteria. They're small and microscopic because that's the only energy that's that's the much energy they have they can only support that small body frame okay. so that's basically the reason why of all of our big biological questions of life that we have to answer in order to reproduce the most important one straight out of the gate is your energy plan your energy plan basically informs how your existence and your reality is going to play out it's kind of like money isn't it your choice of career is basically going to define your reality going forward my reality is devoid of owning a Bentley or a big palatial house, um, which seems to be the majority of what's available in Denver, but uh, right, or anything of that nature. So I don't have a lot of expensive hobbies. I can't ski. I can't do a lot of the fun stuff that a lot of people do because there's no such thing as discretionary income, but that's because of the choice I made early on of the career that I wanted to do, right? By choosing what I wanted to do for a living, it immediately set the limitations of what I could become and what my reality could be. If I wanted to be a billionaire, I could have been, but I would have had to have gone into a completely different industry and done completely different things, right? That would have had to have been a decision that somebody else made. And I have a lot of friends who make a lot more money than me and, and live considerably more opulent lives than I do because they chose different pathways, right? So ultimately, when you take a look at biological reality and the organisms that are out there, including us human beings, a lot of times the reality of our cells and our physiology is essentially the consequences of the decisions that were made biologically early on. Matter of fact, that's actually true for life in general. If you think about it, your life your reality, what you know is reality, is essentially the consequences of all the decisions that you made before this moment. Good, bad, or indifferent, right? And it's not like a good or bad thing. It's just, it is what it is. 
And that's the reason why the best way to change your circumstances is to change your decision-making strategy. Because regardless of where you go in your future or what you become or where you are, that statement will always be true. Your present is always simply just the accumulation of all the consequences of all of your decisions made before that. So in reality, where you are can only be one person's doing. Yours. That's a very kind of an independence kind of a view of things, right? It's more complicated than that, obviously, right? We can make all the decisions we want, but we need a structure around us that will allow us to make those decisions and things like that. So there's more to that, but that's generally true. So what if you're not breathing oxygen? You're in fermentation territory. Guess what? You still have to deal with your waste products, right? So your oxygen is not available, but you still have to get rid of your pyruvate. And so what we do as organisms is we still have our two ATP. That's happy. But what we do is we essentially take our pyruvate and we essentially add the electrons to our pyruvate. And that turns it into lactate or lactic acid. So if you've ever basically worked out and you kind of feel a little bit of that burn in your muscles, that's temporary until your oxygen kicks in, until your breathing kicks in, and then it kind of disappears, that's lactic acid buildup, which is not what you want. If you feel lactic acid buildup, then you need to sort of slow yourself down a little bit. You're kind of in anaerobic territory. That's not efficient. You want to drop into aerobic territory, so you shouldn't feel that lactic acid burn in your muscles if you're working at maximum efficiency. That makes sense? Okay. So there's the end of that one. Let's see whether or not I had the clairvoyance or not to actually load up chapter four. It's not looking like it. Of course, that'd be too easy. I knew I was probably gonna have to do this. Okay. <laughs> Just bear with me here while I load up the next chapter. Did I do it here? Yes, I did. Mark, sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes. Okay. Chapter four, no rest for the weary, right? So basically now we're gonna be taking a look at all that. That's kind of our general biology. Now we're gonna be really angling toward our anatomy and physiology, right? So, and that's about right, you know, a quarter of sort of general biology foundation and then the rest of the semester is all AMP stuff, right? So let's go ahead and take a look at chapter four. So chapter four is important. It's a little on the long side, um, I'm going to try to move through it as quickly as possible, but also not so fast that everybody has whiplash. It's kind of difficult not to do that anyway, because it's a survey course. But this is the tissues, right? So we basically took a look at cells. We took a look at structure cells. Now we're going to be using these cells to build tissues. And in the body, basically, you have different collections of cells. There's four major tissue types. There's connective tissue, muscular tissue, nervous tissue, and epithelial tissue. We're going to be taking a look at each one of these in turn, okay? So we're gonna dig into the nitty gritty of this. So the first place we're gonna stop is gonna be connective tissue. So connective tissue basically has a couple of components to it. Number one, you have specialized cells associated with it. We'll take a look at that. You're gonna have ground substance, which is actually part of your ECM, your extracellular matrix. And then you have protein fibers, which are also part of that ECM. Now the ground substance, which is kind of this amorphous substance is basically non-cellular material. Oftentimes it varies in consistency. It can be kind of a quasi gel like structure. It can be a little more wet and slipperier um, in bone. It's solid in blood, it's fluid, and it can sort of range in terms of a consistency all the way throughout. But generally speaking, whenever you take a look at connective tissue, connective tissue, remember, understand is basically dominated 
by the extracellular matrix. So what you understand as the tissue of connective tissue is actually the extracellular matrix of these connective tissue cells. And so this is kind of what it looks like. So here's an example of some of the things that are in there. For instance, you'll see in your connective tissue, um, like fat, fat cells or a type of connective tissue. We'll take a look at that here in just a second. Um, ground substance, which is sort of the background matrix of the extracellular matrix, will kind of be the background filler um, associated with your extracellular matrix, within which you're going to load up elastic fibers, which are these little thin cables. Remember, that's for flexibility um, and um, elasticity. You also have collagen fibers, which are thicker and more structural. They will be basically in the extracellular matrix as well. Fibroblasts are the cells that will essentially produce your uh, connective tissue. So they're actually the ones that make the connective tissue and lay it all down. So that extracellular matrix piece of it. Um, reticular fibers is a type of connective tissue that basically kind of creates a sort of branch network. We're going to see examples of these in turn. So we're going to be expanding on these a little bit. You'll also see in this uh, tissue, you'll see white blood cells in here that are designed to engulf pathogens when they invade. Like if you cut yourself, you're damaging your connective tissue. So your white blood cells have to be in there to do the attack attack those pathogens. Um, you also have stem cells, which is a source of new cells. So anytime you damage cells or cells die, you have to replace them and stem cells will do that, okay? So, and of course you have blood vessels to feed all these cells in there as well. So let's take a look at, first of all, the first piece of the ECM, um, and that is the protein fibers. So first of all, you're going to have collagen fibers, which are tough and strong, durable, so this is basically if you want some toughness in your extracellular matrix. Particular fibers tend to be thin and highly branched, but they're also collagenous in nature. So they're not as tough as pure collagen. And then your elastic fibers made by the protein elastin is going to be stretchy. It's going to be elastic, right? It's going to be elastic and flexible. So this is going to allow you some stretch in that connective tissue. Now, generally speaking, when you take a look at your connective tissue, hold on for a second. Just saw something really quick. I just want to double check on something. You have a couple of major types of connective tissue because typically with connective tissue, you're looking at support, general support, structural support. of the body of various other tissues. So you're a tissue that supports other tissues, okay? So you have a couple of different types. You have what's called fibrous, supportive, and then of course your fluid connective tissue. And they kind of break into a flow chart that looks something like this. So let's take a look at the fibrous connective tissue first. So fibrous tissue can be further subdivided into either loose or dense connective tissue, so-called because of their packing. For instance, loose fibers tend to be sort of a loose open network. That's why they're called loose. Dense tends to be very densely packed. That's why they're called dense. Your supportive connective tissue typically is cartilage and bone, right? Bone is solid, cartilage is flexible. We'll take a look at those here as well. Your fluid connective tissue, you have two different types, blood, basically, which is a fluid connective tissue that holds your blood cells and white blood cells and things like that. And lymph, which is also a type of fluid that supports your white blood cells, right? So that's part of your immune system. And so those are basically your major types of connective tissue. Now, when you take a look at the fibrous connective tissue, that is to say the loose and the dense, we're gonna start off with loose and we'll talk about dense. Basically, your fibrous connective tissue is all laid down by the fibroblasts. So these are the guys that will lay down this connective tissue matrix, which is a combination of ground substance and whatever protein fibers you want in there to varying degrees, right? So you, if you want more structure, you load it up with collagen. You want more elasticity, you load it up with elastin. If you want kind of a little bit of a difference between the two, you kind of add mixes of each. So you can have a lot of nuanced um, outputs of your extra matrix of your connective tissue based on what you put in there. Okay. Now, if you're a loose type of fibrous, typically you come in a couple of major categories. First of all, you're either going to be areolar in nature, 
reticular or you're going to be adipose tissue, which is fat. We're going to see examples of these guys here in just a second. That's to be compared with dense fibrous connective tissue. Generally, we find these in tendons and ligaments. Mostly these guys are very collagenous. Sometimes they can be reticular, but they're all dense. They're all fine, hugely like massively packed, very densely packed uh, types of tissues in there. So tendons are basically how you connect muscles to bones. And then of course, ligaments is how you connect bones to bones, right? Um, and so here's kind of what it looks like. So here is our, our loose fibrous tissue. This is an example of what's called areolar. This is oftentimes what I refer to as loose fill. So sometimes you don't want air pockets in your tissues. And so you have to put, fill out air pocket up with something, right? And so oftentimes what you'll use is you use like a loose fill connective tissue to kind of just fill that in. Well, here's the thing. When you're filling that in, you have structural requirements, right? You have different types of things. Like for instance, if I lay down an epithelial layer and I say, I need, a, I need to fill this space underneath it with something, I need to fill it with something. The question is, what do you fill it with? Well, it depends on what kind of physical mechanical stress this tissue is going to be incurring. So if it's not that much mechanical stress, then you could probably pack it in there with some fairly loose fill. It doesn't really matter. It's not going to be that structurally, you know, significant anyway. It's just you're filling in the spaces. That's what you use areolar tissue for. You can see you've got your thick collagenous fibers here, your thin elastin fibers, and of course you've got fibroblast nuclei here that are laying it all down for you. Now that's to be compared with dense fibrous, where here you can see now, this is a different situation, right? Now you've got a completely different function. This is like a tendon that you're looking at here. This is basically where they're taking this from. It's a tendon of a muscle. Whereas the areolar is basically that connective tissue that's right underneath your skin, right? So there's not going to be, you know, as much wear and tear on that one. So you can get away from this, you get, get away with this loose fill in there. Um, but when you're taking a look at this guy here, you notice that you're going to be putting a lot of stress and strain on this tendon. Every time you flex this muscle, every time you take a step, you're going to be putting force on this tendon. You don't want this thing to rip. So what do you do? You add a lot of structural integrity in there. You load it up with collagen. These waves of collagen, mostly collagen, is going to create a really strong rope-like resistance to that motion and to that wear and tear. So it's not going to tear under most circumstances. Underneath that as well, you're going to see this is your knee joint. You're going to see fat pads in there for shock absorption. And so this is a type of loose connective tissue, adipose tissue is. And then you see your two supportive connective tissues. So hyaline cartilage, which is basically the tips of your bones. It's what's called articular cartilage. Uh, generally speaking, you can see these cartilaginous cells here. Um, do this thing. Right, so you can see it's cartilaginous cells here, but they're living inside these little spaces. Those spaces are what's called lacuna. So these are the little spaces that these cells live in. And then this piece here, this kind of airbrushed, kind of glossy looking, that is the cartilaginous tissue. Okay, so it's almost kind of like it's the cell is sort of like trapped inside the cartilaginous tissue. It's got a little air pocket that it lives in, the lacuna but the cell is inside that and it's surrounded by the sea of cartilaginous tissue, this kind of glassy brushed look of the hyaline cartilage. And then bone, which is also supportive, is solid, is basically going to be, uh, looks like this. You can see also the same basic idea here. These little black dashes here are actually osteocytes. Those are bone cells inside their own little lacuna. So if you were to blow this up, what you would see is like a little bone cell it would be inside its little lacuna. So the lacuna is that little hollowing area. The osteocyte is the cell that's inside that. And then what they've done is they've load, laid down rings of bony matrix in this sort of circular fashion. And that basically is the structure of the bone. So you kind of just lay down this hard bony matrix. So this is an example of the reason why we study tissues is because when we look at an area of the body and study the anatomy of the body, it's composed of not just one tissue, but oftentimes an entire spectrum of different tissues. And so in order to understand how that particular organ is built and how it functions, it requires us to understand how those tissues 
are built and come together in order to form that organ. Okay. So your loose fibrous, we talked a little bit about areolar, which is loose spill, but now we're going to talk about adipose tissue. Adipose tissue is basically fat cells. So adipose sites are the actual cells. They're essentially filled with liquid fat, a drop of liquid that's in there. And so these guys are the ones that store fat um, in there. Um, and they don't have a lot of extra matrix, right? So basically what they are is just little cells full of fat. And that's your fat reserve. So they are basically going to be functioning to store your excess energy, the fat energy. It's going to also be involved in insulation, right? I mean, there's a reason why animals fatten up for the winter um, is because that fat insulates them and keeps them warm throughout the winter. And it's also good for cushioning, right? It's also uh, one of the reasons why you see a lot of fat around organs is because that fat is protecting those organs from physical blows that could otherwise damage the organ. And so it's like a shock absorber. And you also have this a lot underneath the skin and that subcutaneous fat is a lot of your energy storage. So for instance, that subcutaneous fat that you see around the belly or on the hips, that's basically where your, your body likes to sort of store a lot of fat, okay? Is in that kind of waist area underneath the skin and also uh, in your hip area underneath the skin. So now let's take a look at the dense fibrous. So the dense fibrous connective tissue is gonna have these really densely packed collagen fibers. And uh, generally speaking, these guys are gonna be specifically found in tendons and ligaments. They look very similar actually in the microscope when you see them. Just as one is connecting muscles to bones, that's the tendons. The other one's connecting bones to bones. That's gonna be the ligaments, okay? So that's, um, that's our dominant sort of um, um, our loose and dense connective tissue. Now about our supportive. You have two major types of supportive connective tissue, right? You have cartilage and you have bone. And so typically you're looking at structure, shape, right? Your cartilage gives your body shape. It's also for protection. Your bones will protect you and also for movement. A lot of our bones that we think about are for ambulation, so your ability to move and walk around. Generally speaking, cartilage is a lot more flexible than the bone, which is solid, um, but bone is mineralized. So that basically is a key function of bone itself. So let's take a look at cartilage first, and we'll take a look at bones next. So cartilage basically is driven by a couple of cell types. So chondrocytes, so chondro basically refers to cartilage, and then the term site refers to cell. So chondrocyte is a cartilage cell. A chondroblast, blast basically is a developmental cell. That lays down new matrix. In this case, it's laying down cartilaginous matrix. So each of these guys will basically clear out a little hollow called the lacunae, and they'll be surrounded <clears throat> by the matrix. For cartilage, it's solid, but it's flexible. A good example of cartilage, hyaline cartilage in particular, which is the one you mostly see, is your nose, your nasal cartilage, right? So the tip of your nose is all nasal cartilage, so you can kind of bend your nose back and forth, and it basically naturally flexes right back to its normal shape problem with cartilage is it's not vascular. That means there's no direct blood, the blood supply to the cartilage, which is the reason why cartilage heals slowly. Why? Because you need blood to transport the tissue, the cells. For wound repair. If you don't have blood going there, you're not going to get the cells there, which means you're not going to be able to repair the wound. Cartilage is slow healing. Okay. And so it's not vascular. That's an important thing. That's a very important difference between cartilage and bony matrix, say, for instance. So when you take a look at cartilage, there's three dominant types. We saw an example of one already, um, and they have different roles. 
the one that's the most prevalent in the body is hyaline cartilage, right? So these typically will have fine collagenous fibers. They're found in most areas that you would expect to see cartilage. So for instance, your nasal cartilage is hyaline cartilage. Um, the ends of your long bones, those articular cartilages we just saw in the knee or that cartilage, that's hyaline cartilage. Uh, all your joints, uh, by the way, especially your synovial joints, will have that little layer of cartilage over the bones. Um, that's basically all hyaline cartilage. It's kind of like uh, a little protective layer to keep uh, you from getting bone on bone grinding away of the actual bony matrix. So you put a little layer of protective hyaline cartilage on there, which still hurts um, because the cartilage isn't supposed to touch the, each other either. Um, when they do, that's typically like arthritis, like when your knees are getting shot. A lot of times people who have lost their, their, um, their other, their, uh, we haven't talked about it, but um, there are other types of pads in there and things like that. Um, you'll get cartilage on cartilage rubbing in the knee and that basically hurts. So you have to get like a knee replacement surgery. So it still hurts if you have cartilage on cartilage. Um, just not as much as it would hurt if you had bone on bone. That would really be unamazing, uh, amazingly painful um, if you did that one. You have elastic cartilage. The most um, dominant elastic cartilage is your outer ear. So this is all elastic cartilage. Very flexible, very elastic. So you can crush it down. You can squash it all up. And then pff, there it goes right back. Right. So that's kind of what elastic cartilage does for you. Um, and then fibrocartilage, which is less common, is very strong, very tough, very collagenous. You only find it in one of two places. Uh, well, three places, actually. Um, you find it padding your discs, your vertebral discs. So there's a little fibrocartilage plug in between your vertebra, keeping your vertebra from basically clapping onto each other. Okay. You also have one, what's called your pubic symphysis. So your two pubic bones, um, will come together. And so there's a little plug of fiber cartilage there to keep your pubic bones from clapping together every time you take a step. Because every time you took a step, if those clapped together, you would be screaming in pain. And so that little pubic symphysis kind of keeps that from happening. And also I mentioned the knee. There's fiber cartilage plugs called the meniscus, right? Some of you guys may have heard of that. Somebody like a skier or an athlete has torn their meniscus. That's a little plug of fiber cartilage in between your tibia and your femur that kind of acts like a little spongy shock absorber in between those two bones and keeps um, your, those hyaline cartilages from touching each other, okay? So if you've blown your meniscus, then you're probably staring at um, some pretty bad knee arthritis and knee replacement at some point in the future because you're gonna feel your hyaline cartilage at some point if you don't now. Okay, let's take a look at bone. Bone is a little bit different than cartilage. Why? Because it's rigid, it's solid, and hard. The reason is because the matrix of bone is not just made out of collagen. That one we know, right? There's other connective tissues that have collagen in them as well, including cartilage. So what's the difference with bone? Well, it also has calcium salts. And the calcium salts basically will wrap themselves around the proteins and then what they'll do is they'll harden the bone itself. It's kind of like a, a curing agent in concrete, right? So you have just the smooth liquid concrete and then you add the curing agent and then that's gonna harden it up. And that's kind of what bone is like. So there are two major types of bony tissue that we see, compact and spongy. And so we'll take a look at those um, a little bit just briefly. But these uh, matrix, this bony matrix is laid down by, like we had with cartilage, by laid down by osteoblasts, which basically lay down new bony matrix and osteoclasts, which basically break down the bony matrix. And so the interplay between those two, one builds it, one tears it down, is a little bit of a balance, right? So you kind of have the ability to go both ways. So when you take a look at compact bone, the image of compact bone we actually saw before. This guy right here is the way compact bone looks. 
It's made of these little circular concentric ring-like structures called osteons that you pack together in lots of different circles and then you interfill them, right? So a compact bone has all these osteons all kind of packed against each other. And then you kind of fill in the gaps and that's your compact bone. And then in the middle of these osteons is a blood vessel called the central canal. So basically that's what's feeding these osteocytes. Remember, their cells too, they also have to eat. And so you have a blood supply to feed them. Um, and it kind of diffuses throughout this osteon structure to kind of get to those cells. Now, spongy bone is a little bit different because basically they have, uh, it's called spongy because it looks like a sponge, right? So they have what's called long trabecula, which kind of forms like all these like little kind of tentacle-like, what's called ribs of bone that then creates these like little nooks and crannies that are all kind of in, it looks like a sponge. I can't really draw spongy bone very well, but it looks like a sponge. I don't think they had it up here, but um, those nooks and crannies basically will um, allow you some room for vasculature and things like that. So what about the fluid connective tissue? And uh, what I will do is I'll uh, finish this section with the fluid connective tissue. So we have blood and lymph, right? So blood is called a connective tissue. Why? Because it's supportive. Because the fluid matrix in the blood, which is your plasma, and that's a straw colored fluid when your blood settles out, or it's the same straw colored fluid when you have a sore that oozes, right? That is the fluid matrix. So this is the supportive piece. Who's it supporting? It's for supporting the form cells or the formed elements, which is essentially the cells of the blood. So what cells are in the blood? Well, you have a couple of them, right? So first of all, red blood cells, erythrocytes. These are the ones that are carrying oxygen around your body. You have white blood cells, which are essentially your immune cells that are fighting off infection. And then of course you have platelets, which are little chunks of cells from a cell called thrombocytes, which are involved in blood clotting. And so those three are basically what's being supported by your supportive matrix, right? So the fluid portion of your blood is considered the connective tissue. And then that's supporting and giving support to your blood cells, okay? Lymph is similar in the sense that it's a fluid the typically will take fluid in from your tissues. Um, it'll also have white blood cells in it. So it's supporting white blood cells. Uh, but because it's a fluid base and it's supporting white blood cells, it's similar to blood plasma in the sense that it has a liquid support stru structure. It's just supporting slightly different cells. Okay. So that is your lymph uh, solution. So your lymph as a liquid um, or fluid connective tissue. Now let's take a look at and get started. We'll start off some muscular tissue. So let's get started with our muscular tissue. So this is the contractile tissue. It's designed to contract. That's what it does for a living. So when we take a look at a muscle cell in musculology, we have a specific name for it, referred to it as a muscle fiber. So a fiber basically is equal to the cell of the muscle. We have three main types of muscle. We have skeletal, smooth, and cardiac in turn. So we'll take a look at each one of those in turn. Skeletal muscle is basically the one that, that we that's kind of the most common. Matter of fact, if I ask you point to a muscle in your body, chances are you'd point to a skeletal muscle, okay? So these guys are attached to your skeleton by the tendons, right, which are connective tissue. And their job is to move the skeleton. So this is basically your ambulation. And generally speaking, it's important to note that these are under voluntary control. You can choose when and where and how to move your skeletal muscles, and that's important. The fibers themselves tend to be very long um, and oftentimes they'll have multiple nuclei. The important thing about these and the real distinct feature of these is they're striated or striped in appearance. So they'd be long and cylindrical with multiple nuclei in them. And then they tend to have this striped look. 
and that's your muscle fiber. So it's kind of what it looks like. So you can see here you have uh, multiple nuclei, but you can see this little like candy cane like striping associated with the skeletal. That's pretty typical. I mean, we'll talk more about what these stripes are a little later on when we get to like muscle physiology. Um, but that's basically your skeletal muscle. Smooth muscle is a little bit different. There's no striations in smooth muscle. They tend to be spindle shaped with one nucleus. So they look like a little pile of gummy worms. Something like this. And typically they're involuntary. So you're not under control of them. And as a result, they tend to line the walls of organs and things of that nature. So that's kind of what they look like. So you can see how you can, they're basically like little, like a little pile of gummy worms um, that basically form the outer portion of organs, your blood vessels and things like that. So this is basically what's driving and constricting your blood vessels. It's also what's co controlling the movement of your digestive system and your stomach. That's all smooth muscle, okay? So all the movement of your, of your organs. Cardiac muscle, I'm gonna finish with these last two slides, is only in the walls of the heart. They have slight striations, they're involuntary, have to be. They typically have a single nucleus, but they're connected by what's called intercalated discs, and they have gap junctions in them. So if you take a look at cardiac muscle, this is what it looks like. So you can see these little purple lines right here. These are the intercalated discs. That shows you the end of one cell and the beginning of the next. You can also see there's slight striation in these as well. And the other thing is they're basically interconnected. Like a net. So basically what happens is one cell will connect to another cell. So go like this. So they're all kind of interconnected like a little net. So if you were to like pull them apart, they'd all be kind of interconnected like that. And, and, and basically terminated by these gap junctions. Okay. So what we'll do is we will start with nervous tissue um, next time. Um, just for points of announcement, let me stop the